So today's episode will cover a little bit of alternative history around the Second World War, and you can go off and create your own alternative history on Call of War. This is a free PvP strategy game which you can play on both mobile and your PC, and there you can take control of a historic country on the outset of the war, and play against up to 100 real players over several weeks. Create your own army and use tanks, planes, ships and infantry to defend your country, or go off and rewrite history and create an empire of your own. Plus, as you are playing against real players, you can create all sorts of alliances to retell history. For instance, you can expand the RAF and dominate the skies while researching tech like nuclear weapons to win as the British, or create an Eastern European alliance to push the Soviets back, or even unite Scandinavia, create a fleet and control the seas. There's an unlimited amount of possibilities. Plus, by following the link below, you'll be supporting this channel and you'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. But this is only available for 30 days, so don't lose any time in doing it. And for the first of you to click that link, you can also join a special game that I have created. Just type Jabsy in the search bar and use the password Jabsy, and I'll see you out there personally on the battlefield. So get Call of War today and rewrite history. But for this little bit of alternative history, we will look at how the Second World War may have started years earlier and the combatants would have been completely different. This is because Mussolini sent troops to his northern border in 1934 to prevent the Nazis from taking over Austria, who he was allied with. Hitler had, after all, had the fascist leader of Austria assassinated and, with the Austrian Nazis, looked to take power in the country. One misstep would therefore have brought the two nations into war, but more than that, the French and British would later sign an agreement with the Italians to defend the Austrians, so you can assume that the British, French and Italians would fight against the Germans, who, at this point in history, hadn't had time to build up their forces. So the main issue here was Austria and the differences between fascism and Nazism. Now many people today think they are somewhat interchangeable, but at that time there were some differences, and early on, Mussolini seemed to have disliked Hitler, especially for his anti-Semitism. Apparently, Mussolini said to a journalist named Indro Montanelli, racism is blonde stuff. So Nazism was more racial based than fascism. And as I said before, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany were also divided on what to do with Austria. Mussolini, for instance, shortly after Hitler took power, signed the Rome Protocols with Dolphus of Austria and Horty of Hungary and together they seemed poised to form a fascist alliance of sorts, sort of aimed against the Germans. Plus, beneficial to the Italians, Hungary and Austria would act as a sort of buffer state between themselves and Germany. Plus, the Rome Protocols also had another goal in mind, and that is carving up Yugoslavia, as they all had some claims on the country. But events in Austria meant that the Rome Protocols would only ever remain an economic agreement. This is because within Austria, as you would expect as they are wedged between fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, the divisions between fascism and Nazism within their country boiled over into assassinations and coups. As for the Austrian population, especially in Vienna, they had favoured socialism and communism, but the Chancellor, Engelbert Dolphus, united the Christian Social Party with the Homeland Bloc. This Homeland Bloc, by the way, was largely a paramilitary organisation, similar to the Freikorps in a way, and at certain points, they had a following of over 400,000 people. Plus, keep in mind, this is a country that only had around 6 million people. This unification of the Catholic Church and right-wing paramilitaries formed the core of Austro-Fascism. A civil war then erupted between the socialists and the fascists in 1934, Dolphus succeeded and banned many political parties, thus becoming a one-party fascist state. However, his form of fascism, as I said before, was more in line with Mussolini's Italy or even Salazar's Portugal rather than Hitler's Germany. In fact, he feared the rise of Hitler across the border in 1933 as Hitler encouraged new opposition to Austro-Fascism. The Greater German People's Party and the Austrian Nazi Party, for instance, sought to undermine the fascists and unite Austria with Germany. They began to push for action against the ruling fascists and they were clearly receiving support from the German Nazis. For instance, Austrian emigrants in Bavaria formed the Austrian Legion, while in Austria itself, a branch of the SS was formed. Then, just a couple months after the Civil War ended, these Austrian Nazis disguised themselves as Austrian soldiers to enter the palace and assassinate Dolphus in the July Putsch. Meanwhile, the Austrian Legion tried to cross the border and invade. However, they made a crucial mistake. They came unarmed. This is because they believed that the soldiers and Austrian population at large would join them, but this didn't happen and the Putsch failed. However, let's imagine they came armed. Well, this would have been seen as an invasion, and therefore World War II could have erupted in 1934, 
but this time the Italians would lead the charge against the Germans. Mussolini had, after all, sent secret letters to Dolphus promising to defend the independence of Austria, plus Dolphus and the fascists, as you would expect, would hope to keep Austria a Catholic country free from the Nazis. And, in fact, the two allegedly saw Hitler as being more in line with Stalin than themselves. So once the putsch took place, Mussolini sent divisions north to the Austrian border and prepared to defend his ally. It's hard to say that the Italians would stand much of a fighting chance if numbers were equal, and there are a few reasons behind this. For instance, if you compare the composition of each division, you will see the Germans would bring far bigger artillery, more machine guns, and nearly four times the amount of non-commissioned officers. But this was still 1934. As the putsch failed to gain any supporters in the Austrian army, you would have the entire Austrian army, plus at least a couple hundred thousand members of the Homeland Front paramilitaries, prepared to defend Austria. Meanwhile, Mussolini often spoke about how he could mobilise upwards of 6 million people during this period, but we can safely assume that this is an exaggeration. You could probably half this number, or half it again to get a fairer number, it's really hard to know how many people could be mobilised in Italy. Yet whatever the case may be, the Nazis had not reintroduced conscription yet, and the Night of the Long Night had just taken place a month prior, leaving the armed forces in a bit of disarray. Although the Germans had already begun going against the Treaty of Versailles, they only so obviously rearmed in late 1935, so at this point they were relatively weak. So Hitler agreed to step down and claimed to have no part in the putsch. But Mussolini still kept an eye on events in Austria, while Kurt Schnuschnig took control of the Austro-Fascists. Many Austrian Nazis were then imprisoned, and the pro-German parties were driven underground. Then, in 1935, the French met with Mussolini and made an agreement. They agreed to hand over land in Africa to the Italians, like what is today southern Libya. Then, Pierre Laval of France and Ramsay MacDonald of Britain met with Mussolini in Stresa in northern Italy. This conference was called for shortly after the Nazis reintroduced conscription, so it was clearly aimed at containing German power in Europe. Plus, one of the main concerns of the conference was making sure that Austria remained an independent nation. So now that is Austria, Italy, France and Britain in a potential war against Nazi Germany, plus thrown other countries like Hungary, and it seems like the Nazis could well have been defeated pretty quickly. However, there are two main reasons why the Stresa Front did not last very long. First, the British, without informing Mussolini or the French, signed a naval treaty with the Germans. This treaty allowed Germany to rebuild their navy somewhat, and came as a surprise to the other powers. For Britain, they believed this treaty would mark the beginning of voluntary arms limitation, whereas the Germans hoped this could well have brought Britain into an alliance with them against the Soviets, or even the French. Hitler, in fact, called that day the happiest of his life. But, as you'd expect, the French saw it as treachery and further appeasement. The second major issue was the Italian designs on invading Ethiopia. This wasn't discussed during the conference at Stresa, yet Mussolini took silence to be approval. So, in October 1935, he attacked Ethiopia. This isolated the Italians from the Western powers, however, since the Anglo-German naval treaty, it appeared that the British were unwilling to step in to stop Hitler themselves, so it showed Hitler to be strong, and pushed Mussolini further onto the Nazi side. Although the British made statements about upholding Ethiopian independence, especially after the election of Stanley Baldwin, the chiefs of the military advised against it. So they had no intention of going to war against the Italians, and some still wanted to bring Italy back into the fold. The French and British therefore offered large chunks of Ethiopia to the Italians, while the rest of the country would be in their sphere of influence. This was all part of the Hall of Al Pact of December 1935, and they hoped that this would encourage the Italians to remain on their side, should a war come against Hitler. But the war was proving to be very popular in Italy, then details were leaked to the press. Or, the British Foreign Secretary and Laval, the French Prime Minister, were both forced to resign. The next month, in January 1936, Mussolini informed the German ambassador that he would have no objections to Austria becoming a German satellite. Then, a month after that, he supported Hitler's plans to remilitarize the Rhineland. So to run this all down, in the middle of 1934, Italian troops marched north and threatened war against Germany over the defense of Austria. In early 1935, the French gave the Italians land in Africa, and that April they met at the Stresa Conference. But the Anglo-German naval treaty of June that year changed everything. The Italians invaded Ethiopia shortly afterwards, and by the beginning of 1936, the Italians had quickly changed allegiances. So, as some argue, like Patrick J. Buchanan, World War II could well have been completely avoided, and was, in essence, an unnecessary war. I'm of course skipping over quite a lot during this period, like the Franco-Soviet Treaty of Mutual Assistance, Soviet assistance to the Czechs, and the importance of the Locarno Treaties. But maybe, just maybe, this war could have been avoided, however, to appease the Italians, this would have come at the expense of Ethiopian independence. 
And for all of you who are now interested in rewriting World War II history, remember you can sign up at the link below and play Call of War. Maybe you can try to emulate this scenario with some real life players, or go out on your own and forge a new empire. Plus remember the first people to do so can join in a special map, and everyone who follows the link below will get one month of premium membership for free and 13,000 gold. So sign up today, claim your rewards, and I'll challenge the first batch of you on this special map. I'll see you on the battlefield.